Hi guys, Brian from Brian Bow is here. There are a lot of things that you should be concerned about when it comes to the keeping and breeding of your boa constrictors. However, there are quite a few other things that you really shouldn't worry about. I get a lot of questions from beginning boa keepers about things that they're concerned about, but many of these things are not something that should pose any worry, which I'm gonna discuss today. I also get a lot of questions from people new to breeding boas with certain concerns of theirs. And today I wanna to review some of these concerns that are really not something to worry about. If you're new to the channel, this is the place for information about all aspects of keeping and breeding boas in captivity. So if you like what you see, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my future boa videos. The first type of question I get from a lot of beginners has to do with their boas behavior and it's a behavior they think might not be okay, but often it's just a totally normal boa behavior. One common question is they have a boa and the boa seems to be spending almost all of its time on the cool side of the enclosure. So as long as your enclosure setup and environmental conditions are correct, this is absolutely nothing to be worried about. A lot of my boas seem to spend much of their time on the cool side also. The boas know what temperature to seek out, and they're gonna seek out a, an environment with a temperature that is best suited for their health and their long-term well-being. So that being said, I would definitely double check your cage temperatures. You wanna make sure that your hot side is about 90 degrees at the hot spot, and your cool side is between 75 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And as long as the temperatures are in that range, everything should be fine. If you happen to see you have multiple boas and they're always, always on the hot side or always on the cool side, then you definitely wanna double check because sometimes the thermostats are really way off and you might think it's uh, actually a lot cooler or hotter than it is. So double check the temperatures with a temperature gun laser thermometer and make sure that you're within the desired range for your temperatures. Another common question is that their boa is always burying itself in the substrate. And this is also a entirely normal behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a similar question, they have a boa, but it just hides all day. It's in its hiding, uh, hiding place almost all the time. And this is completely normal. So boa constrictors are ambush predators. And what they do in the wild is they find a nice, comfortable, cozy hiding place, preferably in the dark, and they just sit there waiting for prey to come along. And they might stay, you know, pretty much motionless for many days. And, you know, a rodent or other prey item walks by and then bam. So that's normal for a boa. So if your boa is just hiding all the time, there's, tip, there's probably nothing wrong with it. The contrast between a boa that's just sitting there and a boa that senses a prey item can be like night and day. And I've actually gotten some beginners who are concerned that their boa has too violent of a feeding response. But this is normal. When boas see food, they attack with gusto and they really want to get that food. It's one of the cool things about boas. You typically don't have to worry about uh, snakes that don't eat, unlike some other types of uh, snakes. So if your boa attacks its food with gusto, you don't have anything to be concerned about. That being said, I have a few boas that aren't, they don't really have as much of a violent feeding response. In fact, some of them just kind of grab the uh, mouse or rat in their mouth and just kind of slowly skulk back. You know, that's normal. Again, every boa is an individual and you don't need to be concerned if your boa doesn't feed exactly like some of the other boas. Another common food related worry is whether you should supplement your boas with vitamin supplements. And I have never used vitamin supplements for my boas and I haven't had any health related issues due to vitamin deficiencies or any symptoms in that it would indicate this. I feed my animals a uh, whole prey item, you know, whole rodents or whole birds, which is a well balanced food source for snakes. These are food items that were fed a good diet, you know, so they have a good uh, complement of nutrition. And generally, if you are feeding health, healthy uh, prey items to your boas, you don't need to worry about reptile uh, vitamin supplements. That being said, I haven't uh, done any controlled testing or anything like that. There are certain circumstances where vitamins might make sense, and I don't want to dispel the idea of vitamins altogether. But in general, for general maintenance and husbandry of reptiles, 
uh, boa specifically, uh, they seem to be doing fine without vitamins. I would say the same thing with humans. You know, a lot of people have this craze about taking vitamins and the health supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar business. But most of these things are just really not necessary for most people to be completely healthy. Another issue that's come up a lot recently is whether or not BOAs need lighting, specifically full spectrum ultraviolet lights. And I would say that they don't. I have never used any full spectrum lighting with my BOAs and I haven't had any health issues with them. They seem to be breeding and doing you know, just fine without them. So basically I just use ambient room light, the light coming through the windows, as well as the light in the room. And I have some fluorescent fixtures up that are on during the day to give light for the animals. That being said, I haven't done any controlled studies. I know that there are studies out there which suggest there might be some benefits for boas and other snakes, but in the wild, snakes spend a lot of time hiding, or boas specifically spend a lot of time hiding where they wouldn't get sunlight anyway. And so my boas seem to be doing fine without the ultraviolet. So I would say that in general, you don't need to worry about full spectrum lighting for your snakes and boas specifically. One very common thing that beginners worry about are whether their boa has certain health related issues, certain diseases or parasites. And don't get me wrong, we really need to be worried about these things and take appropriate precautions so our animals don't get any diseases or uh, parasite infestations. That being said, sometimes people actually start interpreting symptoms of their boas as though they already have these diseases. And the prime example is a disease called inclusion body disease or IBD. In the end stages of IBD, the animals will have uh, often will have a neurodegenerative symptom and it was actually called stargazing disease because the animals will actually bend their head back up like this almost as though they're looking up at the stars and their bodies take on all of these unusual contorted shapes. Um, they lose the ability to right themselves when you put them on their back and they have general neuro neurological decline, so symptoms of uh, neurodegeneration. But I often see videos from uh, uh, beginners on Facebook where they have an animal that they think might have IBD from the stargazing symptoms and it's basically an animal that's just raising its head up to try to explore the top of its enclosure. And so this is pretty common with boas that they're gonna be raising their head up and you know looking around at the top of the enclosure. I see it a lot with the Pearl Island boas like this one because these are naturally arboreal boas and live in the trees. So you can see he's kind of like raising his whole body up and just going up, you know, they'll climb. Like if I let him, he would probably wanna climb up on this rack, for example. But that's normal. The type of symptom that is indicative of IBD, the animal looks almost uncoordinated, almost like it's drunk, it's kind of loopy, and it kind of does this. It's actually called corkscrewing, and they form these corkscrew spirals. So the behavior where a boa is just raising its head up to look around is completely normal and not something to be worried about. Another common worry of boa keepers is that their boa has mites. And again, this is something you definitely should be worried about and you should be monitoring very closely because mites are just an awful thing to have in your collection. But often people will see things that they think are mites and they're really not mites. A lot of snakes have freckles or darker scales that superficially might look like mites. And this is one example. This is a VPI junglo. You know, and being a T-positive albino, it doesn't completely wipe out the dark pigment. And as this animal has grown, it's gotten more and more of these dark scales, which superficially do look quite a bit like mites. I'm gonna do a close-up shot, just so you can see what I'm talking about. So if we look up close at this VPI T-positive junglo, you can see there are quite a few of these dark scales. And actually this animal is about two years old and has developed more of them as she's gotten bigger. I actually think they look kind of cool. But they're pretty much the same exact size and shape as a mite. So if you didn't know what a mite was and you just saw them, you might think that they're, they're mites. But they're actually just dark scales and they don't come off. And they're, you know, mites you can actually feel. They're like little bumpy things that get in between the scales. And mites will come off and mites also move. 
as you can see these scales of course don't move these are just normal dark scales not mites and they're not anything that you should be worried about one real common behavior of a boa with a mite infestation is that they'll soak in the water dish in order to try to drown the mites and gain some relief so sometimes people will see their boa soaking and they start panicking because they think it has mites but a lot of times boas just soak for other reasons sometimes when they're going into shed it helps them with the shedding so if you do see your boa soaking what i would do is carefully check the water dish and see if you have any mites and the mites will be these little black flecks that look almost like poppy seeds but just be careful to ascertain that there are mites because often you'll see little pieces of dirt or substrate or you know little flecks of boa poop that are in your water dish and those aren't mites the mites will be all the same size and shape and again they look almost like little poppy seeds that you would see on a bagel so hopefully that put your mind at ease if you've ever been worried about some of these issues regarding boa care. Now I want to shift gears a bit and talk specifically about anxieties related to breeding boas, especially for people that are just getting into breeding them. And so the first is about when you should be breeding boas. And a lot of times people will get their first boa, they'll discover what an amazing, beautiful and cool animal it is. And then maybe a month or two later, they'll get another one. And then they decide they want to fully commit and get into breeding and they start planning all these projects that are going to you know, go out for the next decade. And so my advice would be that for the first few years of boa keeping, you really don't even worry about breeding. Just worry about observing your boa and learning as much as you can about its care. You, know, you can you know, build up a collection of a few really nice boas. But boa breeding is really a lot more complicated and involved uh, than you know, breeding some other types of animals. And it's really not for the faint of heart or for people that are just getting into the hobby. You know, a lot of times they, people will sell pairs of, of boas you know, with the intent that someone goes on to breed them. And it, it seems like in herpeticulture, breeding is held up as the standard that everybody should try to reach. But you know, I think really that this is somewhat misguided. And you know, I've talked about this in previous videos. But I'll just say that in general, focus first on learning as much as you can about the boa, its care. And then when you have a collection that is around five years old and the animals have reached breeding size, at that point you can start thinking about breeding boas. And unfortunately, a lot of people, they get in you know, with a lot of gusto and interest at the beginning. After the newness wears off, after a couple years, they get out of the hobby and they're not even in it long enough for their animals to reach a, a breeding age. The next thing you shouldn't worry about when breeding boas are the exact cycling conditions. And I think people have this misconception that boas behave almost in a mechanical fashion and you have to expose them to a certain temperature level for a certain amount of time in order for them to breed successfully. And this really isn't accurate. I just did a video actually about cycling boas where I went over how I do it, but everybody does it differently. You know, and it seems like a slight cooling at night you know, for a few months over the winter, along with a reduction or a complete absence of food for a few months, is often successful in triggering boas to mate. But people have, have successfully mated and bred boas with no cycling at all. They just treat them the same environmentally throughout the year. And other people have tried with like a lot of different types of cycling and still not been successful. So don't worry about the exact conditions and don't try to just copy and duplicate what everyone else is doing and worrying about what everyone else is doing. Uh, if you watch my video on cycling, I think this is a pretty good starting point, but you wanna you know, vary it year by year. You learn something new every year. You'll want to change your cycling based on your previous year and come up with your own ideal cycling conditions. But again, you know, these animals have survived for millions of years in the wild, so they don't need the exact conditions in order to successfully breed. When you're pairing up your boas, you shouldn't be worried about instant results. A lot of people think that they're gonna put the male in with the female, and then the male will instantly start courting the female and trying to mate, and they'll be able to witness this and it will all be very predictable. And this is really not true at all. 
Sometimes you do see this where the male instantly shows interest and you know something's going on. But other times you don't see any activity at all. Sometimes it might take a month or two. Um, you know, sometimes you don't even witness anything the entire period of four to six months when you have the animals together, which is typically how long I have my animals paired. You know, but then you still get a pregnant female. You know, sometimes you witness a lot of apparent courtship and you know cop even you know mating activity, but the female doesn't become pregnant. So basically, you just need to keep your pairs together for a long time. You know, I'll typically keep my males and females together for about a month or so at a time. I'll separate them out for a week. I'll feed them and then I'll put them back for a month. And this goes on throughout the winter into the spring and sometimes almost to the early summer, although typically my pairings are done by about the end of June. Another thing that you shouldn't be too worried about when you're breeding your boas is exercising any control over their mating behavior. And so when you're breeding boas, you're gonna do everything you can to raise up healthy boas, to get them cycled properly, and to have animals in the prime mating health. And then you wanna pair up animals that are really well adapted or well compatible for each other. But besides that, really the mating is up to the boa. So you just put them together and then you let them, you know, have nature take its course. Some people are constantly checking in and you know, every day they look at their boas, what's going on, what's going on. But in general, it's better to have a more hands-off approach. Let the nature take its course and let the boas do what comes naturally to them. There are a few tricks that you can use if you have a male that doesn't seem to be all that interested. You can use a shed skin from another male and put it in his cage. You can also spray down the enclosure. And I've even heard people doing things as strange as putting animals in a pillowcase in the trunk of their car and driving on a washboard dirt road for 10 or 20 miles. I don't think that that actually works. But, you know, in general, there's not a whole lot that you can do other than wait, be patient, and let the boas do their thing. Along the same lines, you shouldn't be worried about witnessing and recording every single milestone in the breeding of your boas. I've seen comments online where people claim that they saw the pre-ovulation swell on you know, June 1st and then on June 28th they saw ovulation which lasted for 72 hours until this point. And I often think, really, does this person, they really know exactly what is going on at every you know, single stage? Because I sure don't. You know, I put my boas together, I you know, have some idea about what's going on, but all of these individual milestones, it's really not necessary to understand and I think you could drive yourself crazy trying to do this. I think really the important thing to understand is when your boa goes into its pre-ovulation or post-ovulation shed cycle, it's gonna go into a shed that is going to last about you know 10 or 11 days longer than normal. And then it's gonna get a little bit darker after it sheds. And it should hopefully start to coil up over this heat spot and start acting gravid. And that's an important date to record because it tells you uh, often roughly when you can expect your litter. But all these other milestones, you don't really need to know them. You know, sometimes ovulation, especially in true red tails, is pretty subtle and you might not see it. So, you know, try to observe your boas, but don't obsess about exactly when every, you know, milestone of breeding happens. The last thing about boas that you shouldn't worry about, and this applies to both keeping them and breeding them, is what other people are doing. And so people on the Facebook groups and the various boa forums are often very vocal and opinionated about their boa husbandry habits. And sometimes they think that their way is the only way. I've seen so many debates about things that are just basically a waste of time, like debating that only that my substrate is the correct substrate, things like that. The truth is often people's situations are completely different than yours and a different set of circumstances apply. So you can learn a lot from these forums and you know these public discussions, but don't get too obsessed with needing to do things the same way that everyone else is doing them. You know, often people are gonna do things differently. As I've said many times before, there's no real right or wrong for a lot of the things in boa keeping and breeding. So you need to learn from your own experience and do what works best for you. So I hope this video was helpful.
As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.